Okay, so welcome, congratulations. We have made it to the last lecture of 105 for the summer, and um, I hope that you can look back and sort of review um, all the things that you've learned. There's a lot, there's a lot. And I was talking with a student earlier today whose family member was having a medical crisis, and, and it, it, we were sort of saying, wow, how much more he is now able to appreciate what he's learning uh, through the crisis and being able to ask better questions, maybe not completely understanding it, but at least being able to, to communicate better with the nurses and the doctors and with the hospital staff and, and being more confident of what they're saying. Uh, so I, I hope that you can look back. Now, I know right now you've got a couple of tests in front of you, so you're really not relaxing yet and you're really not you know, reminiscing on what you've learned this semester. But I hope that you will have a few minutes you know, later in the August to really kind of think back to where you started and where we've been and I think I've said this before. I mean, how many words do you learn in Spanish one? You know, a few hundred, you know, in a, new, in a Spanish class? Nothing to it. We have 500 vocabulary terms, you know, we have, before we do anything else. So, I mean, you have learned and absorbed a tremendous amount of material. And this material will set you up for great success in the future. Um, in 106, don't throw anything away. In 106, you will find yourself going back and reviewing what we've done in 105. That goes for the lab materials for your Amerman book, Toss Nothing. You will use the same textbook. You'll still use your mastering code. That'll be good for 24 months, so you'll still have access to that. You will still go back and look at your Amerman book as a reference. If you've got an atlas with it, you'll use that. You might even use that student workbook. So don't throw anything away, uh, even your notes. Don't throw anything away. And then in 106, uh, unless something dramatically changes in the next year, um, you won't have to purchase anything other than a lab supplement and a lecture, a lab and a lecture supplement. So not even a book, not even a lab manual, just a couple of MCC handouts, basically. So you will find yourself kind of smiling as you leave the bookstore next time. Uh, now, vocabulary, we will be finishing up the, the deck of cards today, and we're going to just finish up with the terms that you would find in a medical record or terms that you would find on a pharmacy prescription pad. And this brings us to right about 97. And then after we finish up these last vocab, I have a few slides to go back and just review the very end of the urinary system. And then we'll get busy talking about male and female reproductive systems, plural. And that will be the end of the uh, material. Uh, the exam, while well, I'm thinking about business, uh, the exam is going to cover, as you know, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive. The respiratory is mostly just structures, things that we already did in lab. I did sort of lecture a little bit in lab on the respiratory system, and I have posted on Blackboard, on YouTube, another a little bit longer version of that. So if you feel like you're a little bit rough uh, on the respiratory, I definitely recommend you go back and listen to it. And you have time because next Monday your lab exam is done. There is no lecture that day, so you could even wait. I don't wanna to wait too long, but you do have a little bit of extra time. I put that reading day in there to take the pressure off so you didn't have any new material to learn next Monday as you prepared for Wednesday's exam. So hopefully that extra, this whole week, right, to let things sort of settle in and will help you be even more successful on the final exam. Um, <clears throat> the uh, grades are pretty much all in place. The people who just finished lab, their bonus points are already in there from the labs today. So all that's left, everyone in the room, what do we have? Five point quiz that you'll bring to me at, at the exam next week, right? Five points, that should be a nearly perfect score. It's on the board outside. And that's bonus points. Um, there is a PAL quiz that is worth 10. There is a lecture quiz that is worth 10. And there's a lab practical, which is worth 100. And there's a final exam, which is worth 100. So that's 220, 220 or so points left. Look at your total points. And you need at least 720 points for the C. You need at least 820 points, for example, for the B. Look back in the syllabus. It has the point total. And you sort of calculate how many points you still need to earn to get the grade that you want. Okay. Um, if, um, if anyone needs to talk to me about their grades, please do so. We can do that tonight. Um, Wednesday or no, Friday at midnight is the last opportunity to drop the class. So if you have any questions at all about your grade and uh, anything like that, please let me know, certainly before Friday. So if you have to make a decision like that, 
we can talk about it. You can be well informed. So on the vocab, 97 on is just these medical abbreviations. And when you go to the doctor and they're giving you a prescription, they're typically going to write uh, their prescription on a pad. Uh, these have gotten a little bit fancier now with some extra precautions on them. But the pieces and parts are still the same. You will see on there uh, the letters RX. Now, RX is an abbreviation standing from the Latin word for recipe. And basically, the, the, pharma, the, the, the doctor is telling the pharmacist to, to make this or give this to you as a recipe. In the old days, right, you weren't, there weren't pills. The pharmacist actually had to blend and make the medication. So, it, quote, this was the recipe for them to make it. And it's also the instructions that the pharmacist will write on the, on the um, bottle uh, for you to take it. Included will be the drug's name the strength of the drug, milligrams or grams or something like that, and then the number of pills, if it's a pill, or the number of milliliters, if it's a liquid. <clears throat> then they will oftentimes have SIG, colon. And SIG is a Latin word meaning right on the label. So these are truly the instructions for the, for the pharmacist to put on the label. And in those, um, in those instructions, it will have the amount of the dose, you know, how much should you take, how should you take it. Now, most of us take things orally, right? But if you're in a hospital, there might be orders for things to be given IV or injections into the muscle IM or maybe um, uh, rectally, right, a suppository. So there'd be different ways in which a medication could be provided. And then finally, how often is that medication to be given? So all of that would be, would be kind of hidden on or in the script. And the problem is, it's oftentimes in Latin abbreviations. And so you may leave the doctor not quite sure what you're getting. So here are some of these terms. ATC, these are alphabetical. ATC, around the clock. What it means is that the medications must be given at regular intervals. I'm reminded of years ago, I had an ear infection. It was a really bad one. And I had to have injections uh, every eight hours on the on the on the button. So I remember my father driving me into the doctor's uh, the clinic at midnight, at eight in the morning, and then after school at four. So every eight hours, I had to have that injection for it to be properly uh, taken. And as I said on Monday, typically if the doctor just said take something three times a day, you could be rather you know laxical on, on when you took that. So the timing of it isn't that critical. Antivirals are very critical for timing. Some uh, anticonvulsants are very critical for timing. Some people with ADD, right, the medications they take are really rather critical on the timing. And so those would be uh, prescribed differently than just, hey, take it anytime you want, twice a day. BID does mean twice a day. C, and what I say is or, what I couldn't make my computer do is draw a line above this. So you'll see C or C with a line above it, meaning cum, and that's the Latin for with. So you'll see a lot of C's, you know, something with something. Uh, cap just refers to a capsule. CR is tomorrow. DIM is one half. Um, I just remember dimwit, right? You're only half there. Uh, DIM. And then DX, right? Diagnosis. You'll see RX and DX and, and uh, these, these abbreviations. TX meaning treatment. Uh, GTT or GTTS, drops. Okay, so maybe something's two drops or three drops in the ear or, or in the eye. Uh, HX history IM, you're giving an injection into a muscle versus IV injection into a vein. NPO, nothing by mouth. So maybe before surgery or even after surgery, you may have orders of being NPO, nothing. Maybe not even water or ice chips after the surgery or whatever. OD, every day. And OZ, we know that one, ounce. Now here are some equivalents. And I'm not going to ask you to convert anything, but these are helpful things to know. So 30 cc's, cc is a cubic centimeter, and a cubic centimeter is, imagine again, taking a little cube, and each edge of that cube is a centimeter. That would hold the volume of one milliliter. So one cc is the same as one ml, and 30 mls is the same as two tablespoons. So two of the large spoons in the house uh, is equal to um, one ounce. And then PC means after meals. You may also see this written as with food. Okay, with food. So what this is suggesting is that the medication may upset the stomach or it needs to have food to help be absorbed into the gut. So PC, after meals, or with food. Uh, PO, by mouth. So NPO was nothing by mouth. PO is by mouth. <clears throat> PRN, as needed. 
Some of you may work PRN, right? You're called in as needed. Um, you have a, you're, you're on the call or you're on PRN for the weekend. Q, or you might be given a medication, say PRN, like a pain med. Take it if you need it, but you know, only if you need it. Um, Q, each or every. QD is every day. QH is every hour. QID, I wish. Q is no longer each. Now Q is back to four, like in quad. Okay. Uh, QOD is every other day. And RO is to rule out something. Uh, oftentimes, doctors need to justify why they're doing lab tests. And so they may write in the chart uh, blood glucose levels to rule out diabetes. So they have to justify oftentimes some of their extra tests. So they may put rule out. And then lastly, S, or again, S with a line over it, is, is uh, from the Latin sine, meaning without. So C is with and S is without. Stat, do it immediately. T, three times. TSP is a teaspoon. Now these abbreviations are getting out of favor because of how oftentimes people were messing up the big T and the little T. So you won't see this as much. If anything, they're going to spell it out or they're going to put TSP. And a teaspoon is five cc's or five mils. Three teaspoons is a tablespoon, right? So that's the big T. And um, again, like I've been, uh, I've been told that oftentimes in the nurse, in the, in the doctor, now they have to write these words out. <clears throat> this is, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's three times too much or three times too little medication. And that could be a major issue, for example, a, a newborn. Uh, taking even Tylenol, right? Those infant Tylenol drops are very concentrated. They're meant to take just a couple drops, and because the baby can't handle a large volume, they're very concentrated. And parents were giving their kids way too much of those infant Tylenol drugs and, dr and blowing out their livers. And so, you know, a little bit can make a difference uh, in some of these meds. TID is three times a day. You might say TX is treatment. And then finally, Z also can mean teaspoon. If you are in a clinic or a hospital setting and you see any of those abbreviations which have sort of been outlawed or changed, let me know. Okay, I, I hear that these terms are being you know, modified as time goes on. Um, more of it's being checked by computers. We want to make sure there's nothing that can be misinterpreted. So if there's something on here that you think is kind of antiquated that you've seen specifically has been sort of no more, we can't do that anymore, let me know and I'll make sure this list gets updated. But that does bring us to 101 and to the very, very end of the vocabulary. Just vocabulary, right? Over 500 terms this semester. So uh, in 106, at least when I teach 106, I don't do the vocabulary again. I just help expect you to remember all this. Okay. So um, not every bit of it, but I will be reminding you. So when we get to a new term, I'll say, what does that mean? Let's think about what we've already learned and hopefully pull some of these terms back into the forefront so that you can make sense of it all. So on the test... <clears throat> There will be a few terms like we've done before. Uh, that would be, what did I say, 92, 91 back. And, uh, and then there would be a pharmacy, like a interpret what this means, right? So what does BID mean or what does PRN mean or what does PO mean? And that would be what you would fill in on the answer sheet. The vocabulary is not cumulative. And even though there is a cumulative part of this final, it is not going to be vocabulary. So do not feel obligated to go back and spend time looking through the other 450 terms that you've already learned this semester. So I'm going to bring us to the end of the urinary system. And while I'm setting this up, what questions do you have? We had spent time going through the first slides, the first 40 slides or so, and this is where I need to pick up with you. Um, <clears throat> in fact, let me, let me back up. Let me go, actually, I'm going to go forward. You have this picture. <clears throat> what page is this, this image on? 212. 212. This is a nice picture for me to kind of review back what we've done. This represents a simplified nephron, okay? Very simplified. And what, what do we have here? Let's figure out what we have and figure out what we don't have on this. So this would represent, for example, this could be at least a portion of the renal artery coming in, right? So we know the blood comes into the kidney. And then there's branching and branching and branching, like we talked about. We crossed off all those intermediate names. And where we pick up the story is with the afferent arterial, 
right? And that's the small blood vessel that's bringing blood into the glomerulus. In this particular cartoon rendering, this little area here represents that ball of capillaries, the glomerulus. Now, what do we know about those capillaries? What's different about them? Fenestrated, meaning they have little holes in them. And what would be sitting on top of those fenestrated capillaries? What's well, going to give them some extra help and support? Cells called podocytes. And those podocytes are going to uh, help create those filtration slits so that molecules that are filtered out of the glomerulus must pass through both those filtration slits and the little fenestrations of the glomerulus. Then, let's just do blood flow. Then the blood would come out of the glomerulus and go where? Into the efferent arterial. Then where? Peritubular capillaries. Okay? Now, eventually, where does that go? What do they not show on here? Eventually, peritubular capillaries are going to drain into veins that would drain it back out the renal vein, right? What does this wrench represent? Okay, so this yellow, this yellow wrench, I'll change colors here. This wrench here represents kind of the Bowman's capsule, right? And this arrow, this first arrow, what does this arrow represent? What process is happening here at the glomerulus? Filtration. Right, so that's the filtration that happens at the glomerulus. And then the nephron loop, rather than being convoluted tubules, loop of Henle and distal convoluted tubule, has just been simplified into the handle of this wrench. And so the first part, kind of think it as being the proximal tubule. That big arrow represents what process? This big arrow represents what process? Reabsorption. And again, what was reabsorption? Taking, pulling stuff from the tube and putting it boop, right into the capillaries, right back into those peritubular capillaries. Then further down, there'd be the loop of Henle. And then you come out of the loop of Henle, and now you're in the distal convoluted tubule. And you see that little arrow right there going from the right to the left. That arrow represents what process? Secretion. And what molecule did I say we were going to think about for secretion? hydrogen, because you appreciate that the body has to get rid of extra acid, and your urine is more acidic than your blood. So, and that arrow is telling you that secretion is taking things from the blood and putting them back into the tubule that will become urine. And then eventually, as you go through all of these tubes, you're producing urine. And this is not labeled, but this downward arrow, where it says urine, there's one more word that I think is appropriate, and that is excretion. Right, so excretion is the release of that urine out of the body through the urethra. So that's not shown here, that term, but there's an arrow there, right? So I would put on that arrow, excretion. And so this is a, just a nice, simplified overview of the overall kidney. Um, you know that there's millions of these nephrons in your kidneys. If you went to a... Uh, a urologist or a nephrologist, they would talk of the kidney as being one big nephron, right? Uh, we can't go in and see how each individual nephron is doing, but we talk about the overall functioning of the kidney, and we would talk about filtration and reabsorption and things of the kidney in total. So does that make good sense? A little bit of review on the overarching ideas of the kidney and of the nephron. Let's go back and let me pick up the slides that I skipped over. And I know I have a few more slides in my Rolodex here than what you do. So please remind me if I mess up on this. You do have this slide, right? So going back about four or five slides. So urine production, what's going on? Again, the first thing we're going to do to make urine, as we just said, is filtration. Filtration is small things like water and ions and small molecules getting from the blood into the Bowman's capsule. And that stuff we call the filtrate. Right? This is not urine, this is just filtrate. It's essentially the same as plasma. It happens at the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule. Then the next one you have is this one, yes? Reabsorption. 
And then once that filtrate has gotten through the glomerular spaces, now we need to reabsorb. We're going to reabsorb water, osmosis. This is passive, no ATP. This just happens on a concentration gradient. And also, proteins, glucose, electrolytes will also be reabsorbed. This does not, this happens automatically, okay? This has nothing to do with hormones. This, has, this is just simply going to happen regardless of how dehydrated or hydrated your body is. We'll talk about those hormones again in a moment that are dealing later in the kidney, but right now, this is gonna happen regardless of hormones. Then, remember, remind me what your next slide looks like. Not this one? Good, not this one. This one, okay? And then you keep going down the loop of Henle and you come back up to the distal convoluted tubule and there we think about secretion. Okay, and secretion is removing unwanted substances, think primarily hydrogen, pH, acid, and uh, that is gonna allow those molecules to be put directly into what will become the urine. Now, is there anything else from the presentation last time that I can clarify? We went through the anatomy of the kidney. We went through the processes. We went through the blood flow in and out. We talked about the flow of filtrate through the nephron tubes. We know what's happening at each region of that in a simplified way. We know that as that urine is formed, it's going to travel out the pyramids into the minor calyx, to the major calyx, the renal pelvis, down the ureter from the ureter to the bladder, and from the bladder out through the urethra. Does that flow all make good sense? Um, now, there are a couple of hormones that I want you to understand. You do have this slide, right? ADH. Uh, you've heard me mention it a couple times, and I do want you to understand this one. So ADH is a hormone that tells your body, hey, you're dehydrated. And as you become dehydrated, your body senses that and releases ADH. As the name suggests, ADH is going to tell your body to retain that fluid. Diuresis is another word for urination, basically. So anti-diuresis, not to urinate. What this hormone does is it increases the permeability of the distal tubules and the collecting duct to water. Now rephrase that in English. It's going to make it easier for the distal tubule and the collecting duct to reabsorb water. So it's going to pull more of that water out, not allowing it to become urine. Your urine, as a result, would be far more concentrated and dark in color, and your body would retain that fluid as it needs it. But that is not the only... What's the next one you have? I apologize. Yep. Okay, so all these are gone. Then that's not the only hormone that's helping to regulate this. The, another hormone that I want you to know about is atrial natriuretic hormone. You may also, in different books, it's the same thing, you may see it called atrial natriuretic peptide. Same thing. So just to confuse this, you'll see it as A and H or A and P. This hormone is actually released by the heart. You don't normally think of the heart as being endocrine, but the heart does release this hormone. And this hormone is released when the blood pressure is too great. Basically, this is another alarm system. When the pressure is coming into the heart and it's too high, the atria, right, the atria, the atria part of the heart will actually release the cells there, will release this hormone. And what this hormone does is it decreases sodium reabsorption. So let's think about this. Decreasing sodium reabsorption. So as sodium is coming through the tubes, it's not going to reabsorb as much sodium. We learned in lab two that solutes suck. So if more sodium stays in the tubule, water will stay with it. And as a result, you'll pee more, right? So A and P, it's going to go to the kidney and say, let it go. So what you see here is that ADH and ANH are working what we'd call antagonistically. They're working opposite of each other. One is going to help um, 
save water and one is gonna tell the kidneys to let it go. Does that make sense? Okay, ADH and ANH, I know they're very similar in their, in their abbreviations, but they're very different. So if you peed off more water, then it would lower your blood pressure, wouldn't it? And now the heart wouldn't be stressed out quite as much. Two other compounds that you probably know are also diuretics. Alcohol and caffeine are both, med are both molecules that will cause one to urinate more. So what's going on with these? They do, they're both diuretics, but they work in a different way. Alcohol inhibits ADH. Okay, so what does that mean? Imagine you're dehydrated, right? Your body would want to do what? Hold on to fluid. But alcohol actually inhibits ADH. Well, if you inhibit ADH, you're going to urinate more, okay? So that's what alcohol is doing. It is going to, um, and how does it do that? Is it promotes reabsorption of water, okay? Um, it promotes reabsorption. Now, what about caffeine? Caffeine is also a diuretic, okay? Drink coffee, drink pop, that caffeine is a diuretic. It works by inhibiting sodium reabsorption. What does that mean? Same thing as, as A and H, right? Do you agree? Do you agree? Put it together. Caffeine and A and H work the same way. They both cause the body to inhibit sodium reabsorption. Therefore, more sodium in the urine, more water flowing with the sodium. Let's get rid of that water. So alcohol and caffeine are both diuretics but work in different mechanisms. The last thing, and you know this, is that the blood pH where? Strictly regulated at, ideally, 7.4, right? This smack right here, right? And your kidneys are working to balance this a lot. And we've already seen how if you put more acid into your urine, um, we would say that you are, you have acidosis, right? So if your body is building up these acids, and your kidneys are not getting rid of them adequately, then your blood pH will go down, more acidic. And you're dead at 6.8. Right, 6.8 is as low as your pH can go. If you get that low, enzymes and other functions of your body are not going to work. Opposing that, if for some reason your blood pH went up, if it goes up much above 8, you're dead. So there's not much wiggle room here, right? There's really not much wiggle room. The pH, and remember, what's, what's the difference? We're talking about a half a pH value below and a half a pH value above. One pH number. And what does that mean? Tenfold. So you, you're working with it a tenfold, that's it. You're working with a tenfold uh, concentration difference uh, of acid in your blood to maintain life. So what happens as our bodies get older and our urinary system ages with us? The kidneys do start to decrease in size by about age 30. And with that reduced size will come reduced blood flow. There will be a loss of functional nephrons. So over time, you'll have less kidney function. That means that reabsorption and secretion might be reduced or will be reduced. Well. If we can't filter our blood as efficiently, then we're going to you know, have some more acidic products adding up, perhaps. There will also be less ADH. For now, go ahead and cross off aldosterone. I've been crossing off aldosterone all, all week because we're not talking about aldosterone this semester. But there will be less ADH. Now, if your kidneys can't function perfectly and if there's less hormones available, that means your body may start having a greater difficult time maintaining your blood pressure because we, we appreciate that the kidneys and the cardiovascular system, your blood pressure, are connected quite nicely. So that means, you know, with, with decreased kidneys come increased blood pressure problems. The bladder will decrease in size as well, and that will require more frequent uh, visits to the restroom. And hopefully no time soon, you can lose control of those sphincters that we've talked about leading you to become incontinent. Okay.
Any thoughts? Concerns about the urinary system. Where is the problem? Where do you think, where's the one thing that you think you need to go look at really more carefully? It's usually one of two things. It's either the flow of blood in and out of the kidney, or it's the glomerulus, you know, proximal tubule, nephron loops, and figuring out what's kind of happening in each of those sections. Is that the bigger one? Okay. Those are the two stories, right? Those are really the two big things that where some things get a little confused. So go back and look at those areas. And that leaves us just with, ta-da, reproductive. And this should sound, um, in your book, this semester's book, this is all in one chapter, right? Two parts of the same chapter. In the old book I had, it was two different chapters. Um, I'll start off a little bit with sort of a backstory, just a little bit to kind of pull this together. As we go through the reproductive system, or systems, depending upon what book you read, I want you to be comparing and contrasting. Just like we compared arteries and veins, sympathetic and parasympathetic, I want you to be comparing and contrasting male and female structures and sort of the history and the story that I'm telling you related to the number of cells and to the timing of reproduction. Um, to make sense of this, the reproductive organs are really meant to help create gametes. That's really their job. So the formation of gametes. So what are gametes? Gametes are egg or sperm, right? Those are the gametes. And where are the gametes made? In the gonads, right? So you go to the nads to find the gametes. So the, gam the gonads are the sex organs the testes and the ovary, and there we make the gametes. Now, in order to make gametes, there's a very special process that must occur, and that is meiosis. We haven't talked a lot about meiosis. I mentioned it briefly way, way back in chapter three or four when I mentioned that some things can go wrong with your DNA, and one of those things that could go wrong was Down syndrome, right, where there's trisomy 21. And that was an example of a problem occurring in meiosis. That's really all we've said all semester. This could be an entire week of lectures on meiosis. It's rather complex. I'm going to just make it really simple. Um, in the process of meiosis, and this only happens in the production of gametes, rather than the cell dividing and making two identical cells, that's mitosis, the cell is going to divide and make half as much genetic material, and we're going to call that haploid. So the cells that are made here are haploid cells. That means that when egg and sperm come back together, the egg has 23 chromosomes, the, the sperm will have 23 chromosomes, and at fertilization, you re reunite or bring the number back to 46. In males, each meiotic process, each cell that undergoes meiosis is going to create four sperm cells which is quite different in the female, the, the egg production is limited to one egg, okay? So it's a much different number. Now, um, another thing is um, determining male or female. This is a karyogram, really. A karyogram is just a picture of all the chromosomes. And from this, uh, basically, in the old days, um, they would take a cell and they would stop, uh, they would stop metaphase. What does metaphase look like? Remember metaphase? All the chromosomes are lined up along the equator. And they would physically, they would add a chemical to the cell and stop the cell at metaphase. And do you agree that at metaphase, you can see the chromosomes? And then literally, a technician would blow up that picture that they took under the microscope and get out scissors and cut out those chromosomes, and then line those chromosomes up on a piece of paper. And in your cells, you'd have two of chromosome number one, two of chromosome number two, two of chromosome number three, and those are the chromosomes you got, one from mom and one from dad. And then they would line up all the chromosomes like is on this picture, and it turns out that they named, by chance, the largest chromosome is number one. So we got two number ones, and then the smallest chromosome is number 22. 
and they would look for differences between the two chromosomes. Now, this has become far more complex now, but it was done all visually for many, many years until 25, 30 years ago. This was done with paper and pencil. When they did all that, they would find two chromosomes that were unmatched, maybe. And if there was an X and a Y, then that person has the Y chromosome, that person would likely be male. And if they had two matching Xs, they would be female. So sex is determined, the gender, sex, this word is getting all confused, right? But the sex of the baby is determined by the presence of or absence of really the Y chromosome. Women do just fine without a Y chromosome, right, ladies? So you don't need a Y chromosome. Um, guys need a Y chromosome, and everything on that little Y chromosome is pretty much uh, important for maleness, right? Creating and maintaining male structures and male hormones. In, di in trisomy 21, remember there were three 21s. So this karyotype would have had three of these little guys, and that would have been a diagnosis of Down syndrome. So this is just a quick review, a quick reminder of what uh, meiosis does. So we could write meiosis up here. And what's happening is you start off with one cell. This is in the male. So that cell is a spermatogonium. I showed you these cells in lab. And where do you find these spermatogonia? They were the cells lining the seminiferous tubules in the testes. And upon puberty, what happens? Those cells kind of wake up, and they divide. And they make a, an exact copy of themselves. Okay, So the, the divides makes two cells. Um, and this cell then starts meiosis. And in meiosis, you go through two rapid divisions. And in the end, you end up with four haploid, genetically different sperm. So there are millions upon millions and millions of combinations of sperm. Each sperm has a slightly different combination of genetic material. So what happens at fertilization? is going to unite with the egg. Now here is a cartoon of this. Now the, the egg itself is, let me get a darker color. The egg itself in this picture technical difficulties here, there we go. So the egg itself is here, okay? That's the egg. And the egg is surrounded by a layer of cells on the outside. And that's that bubble wrap that I talked about, those cells that are released when the, uh, attached to the egg when it's, when it's released at ovulation. And what you're seeing in this cartoon is hundreds, perhaps even thousands of sperm reaching that egg at the same time. Now only one sperm can enter. And the egg protects itself against this. I mean, there's millions and millions of sperm. I think we always kind of picture, okay, one got there first and sets up a happy family. But no, I mean, there could be hundreds that reach there pretty much at the same time. The first one that penetrates through, and how does it penetrate? Remember the little acrosome, the little bag of, of, of enzymes at the end? will penetrate through, and the first one will enter into the egg within milliseconds, right? Within milliseconds the egg will undergo a electrical change and every sperm thereafter will be rejected. So only the first sperm can win. So then what happens? Now you've got DNA from the sperm, DNA from the egg. They recombine. Now we've got another diploid cell. And what do we call that first cell? Zygo. And zyg means union or marriage of. So that we've brought together the yoking. We brought together the, the egg and sperm. Now, what if, though, statistically, it could happen, it does, what would happen if two sperm did cross the finish line at exactly the same time? Now, what is inside that egg? Three sets of chromosomes, right? One sperm, or uh, one egg part and two from the sperm. The chrome can't survive, right? That is a triploidy, uh, three copies of everything, and that embryo can't survive because you know what mitosis looks like, right? Pairs of chromosomes line up and pairs of chromosomes are separated to the two daughter cells. That third set would absolutely throw everything into a, a havoc. 
and it would not be viable. Okay, twins would be formed by two eggs being fertilized by two sperm. Now, that, in that situation, those twins would be fraternal or non-identical. So for whatever reason, the mother ovulated two eggs, it happens, and two sperm fertilized. Both of those embryos survived and implanted and set up pregnancies. Now, those siblings, those babies, are nothing more than siblings born at the same time, right? I mean, if you think of your brothers and sisters, how different your brothers and sisters are from each other and from you, that's what fraternal twins are. Two kids born at the same time, two egg, two sperm, two totally different beings. Identical twins are when one egg and one sperm fertilize. And for reasons we don't understand, that egg at about the 2, 4, 6, 18, 32 cell stage just spontaneously splits. And each of those halves have the ability of becoming fully functional bodies. So those have exactly the same genetic material. They are identical twins. And, you know, those are your, your identical sets. And then if, by chance, the two then split again, you could have identical quads, and that is extremely, extremely rare. Or you could have identical triplets where it splits, and then one of the two splits again, and now you have three identical beings. Okay. Uh, those are very, very rare natural occurrences. Nowadays, most, not all, but most twins and most multiple births are being um, sort of forced or created through in vitro fertilization. So couples who are having issues will go in and We've learned from Octomom, right? We don't do this much anymore. Right, Octomom, um, I don't know who was more crazy, the doctor or, the, or her, right? But the doctor implanted eight embryos, took eight eggs, and, uh, and fertilized all eight of those eggs, and then put them all in with the turkey baster. And then all eight took, all eight implanted, right? Now, in vitro clinics, What's the purpose of an in vitro clinic? You're gonna pay ten, twenty thousand dollars for a doctor to hopefully guarantee for you a live birth. So they're gonna do things to increase their risks, increase the chances that you'll have a baby. So typically they'll, they'll, they'll take a series of eggs from mom. Eggs don't freeze well. Sperm can freeze, but eggs don't freeze well. So they'll take the eggs and then they'll fertilize them. So now you have embryos. Embryos freeze. So now we freeze the embryos. Most clinics will inject two or three, maybe four, and that's it. And they, they inject all four, and usually only two will make it, so now that person has twins, right? And then they keep the other ones in the deep freezer. And then if that doesn't work, or later in the future you want to go back and have another child, they take four embryos out of the freezer and they inject four, put more you know, in the uterus. Um, that's the way it's normally done. But that either mama or doctor or whomever, right? Putting eight in was really way above um, reason and or it could have just been a freak that normally if you put eight in, only two or three would take. But in this case, all took. She, she um, was able to keep them all amazingly. Okay, um, I got off track there, but you asked about twins, all right? So that's where we get twins. So, so two sperm in one egg would not be twins. That would be non-viable. Here is an electron micrograph. You're seeing the, the sperm uh, penetrating into the outer layers of the egg. So you kind of see that, you know, there's, there's some, definitely some layers that the sperm needs to penetrate through. So let's get to, that's kind of a, just a backdrop story. Let's get to the reproductive systems. Now these systems, really, if you thought about it, are designed simply to help create sexual maturation. And by sexual maturation, I mean that hormones begin being produced and as a result, secondary sex characteristics ensue, breasts develop, ovaries begin to release eggs, sperm production begins, and through that sexual maturation, you're producing the gametes. So really, this, this is what it's all about, right? From a, from a pure biological standpoint, the reproductive systems are a series of plumbing and tubes that are going to make sure that egg and sperm can reunite and create new life. I mentioned in lab that we are all by default female, or at least I think I mentioned it to all the groups. So by default, all of us are female. In other words, every embryo is pre-programmed to simply, by default, 
form ovaries and a uterus and a vagina. About the fifth or sixth week of embryological development, so way early, if the Y chromosome is there, right, and if all the other hormones and chemical signals are right, then the female structures will be inhibited, and now the male structures will be allowed to develop. Okay? So male is, I won't say special, but female is default, male only if the Y chromosome and all the other functions are proper. The cells that create the ovary are the same cells that will create the testis. The cells that create the tubing in both sexes are the same cells that as start off. Um, and we'll refer to these as homologous structures. There is no such thing as a hermaphrodite. Okay, there's no such thing as a human hermaphrodite. You may hear a rumor of it, but there's no such thing. So what is a hermaphrodite? In animal world, earthworms are hermaphroditic, meaning they have both functioning male and female parts. Okay? Now, there are children in this, in this world who are born, and the parents can't tell what they are. Okay, there's a, there's a um, genitalia is nonspecific. The doctor says, you know, the daddy says, is it a boy or a girl? And the doctor says, I'll get back with you on that. It's a very small penis or a very large clitoris. Or is it an enlarged labia? Or is it a very small scrotum? And there's some ambiguity in the genitalia. It's, it, do, it does happen. And so in those situations, uh, nowadays, we can do genetic testing and determine chromosomally, are they male or female? And usually then set the path of if we're going to treat this child as a boy or girl. In the old days, they didn't have that benefit of doing karyotypes. And so the parents kind of looked at each other and said, okay, I guess we'll, we'll raise this child, we'll name it Pat or Chris, and we'll, we'll, we'll raise it as a boy or a girl. And sometimes they were wrong, right? And so that does open up the door for transgender and all this stuff that's going on in the news right now. But it's extremely, extremely rare. Extremely, extremely rare, okay? Um, so you will hear that there are hermaphrodites. There is nobody walking on the planet with both a penis and a vagina, okay? Not functional, okay? Some people are trying to switch things around, but they're not all working, okay? So there's no human hermaphrodites. So as I go through this, let's compare and contrast. So primary sex organs are the gonads. The ovaries and the testes are the primary sex organs. Those organs are producing the gametes, the oocyte or the egg, and the sperm. Those gonads are both producing egg and sperm, and they're producing hormones. So as we mentioned, that makes these glands both exocrine and endocrine. The major hormones in the female are estrogen and progesterone. You've heard of these. And in the male, it is uh, androgens are a group of hormones of which testosterone is one. So the androgens, the androgynous male, right? The, the andro androgens are the male hormones with testosterone being the most common androgen. Both, uh, as we continue to compare, both of these systems have accessory organs. That is fancy tubing and plumbing that is going to assist in the egg or sperm meeting its rightful place and for the formation of the zygote through fertilization. Fertilization is when egg and sperm meet. Um, other words, you know, or actions that allow this to happen be sexual intercourse, coitus, or copulation. I should add to that, that list now, in vitro fertilization, right? Because this can happen in a test tube. Um, the primary organs, the, the testes and the ovaries, are dormant. They're not really doing anything through childhood and until puberty when hormones wake these structures up. At puberty, these hormones are going to be responsible for the external sex characteristics that are seen at puberty, like enlargement of breasts and pubic hair, but also internally is when the reproductive organs are now maturing and are beginning to produce hormones and creating mature gametes. We know this is kind of a scary thing, but women are reaching puberty younger and younger in the Western world. And there's been a few different theories as to why. What have you been hearing? Hormones in animals, possibly. Um, plastics have been thought to have, some plastics have a 
estrogen-like molecule that the body perceives as hormone, soy, right? You hear soy has natural estrogens in it. Um, so we don't really know all the reasons why. And, 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 in order for the reproductive system to start working and making hormones, the body must have adequate fat levels. So which of these is the major reason? We don't know why. But women are reaching puberty earlier, a little bit earlier than they used to 100, 100 years ago and um, in the Western world. And part of that, probably the biggest one, is maybe the hormones, maybe the plastic, uh, maybe the soy, although that would argue that Asians should have really early um, Asian soy-based diets would have earlier me menstruation. So that's not the issue. Um, probably the biggest one is, is body fat. We are definitely a larger group than we were 100 years ago. And body fat is necessary to start making the hormones. A woman who has, more than women than guys, but a woman who is very athletic or is, is um, uh, anorexic and doesn't have enough body fat will not make hormones. And now kids are a little bit chunkier, right, than they used to be. And so they have more fat. So maybe that allows for puberty to begin a little bit earlier than it used to. It doesn't seem to be as much of a, yeah, you would think, right, the estrogens would be mimic or would be interfering with testosterone and maybe slowing down, test, and I don't see or hear evidence of that. So this seems to be more on the female side, right, estrogen stuff, more than I hear it on testosterone side. But it's a good observation. You would think it would sort of do something also to men. Um, so both these systems are producing gametes. The difference is, of course, as we know, the female is only going to produce one egg a month on average, whereas the guys are putting out hundreds of millions of sperm or more a day. Another difference is that the males are going to store those gametes for just a short while in the testes and the epididymis, and then they're destroyed or released. And in the female, um, the number of, of uh, eggs she has was already predetermined, and there are no more being made on a daily basis. In the lab, we looked at the structures, and I said some of them are homologous structures. This is a table to help you with that idea. I think the most obvious is that the ovary is homologous with the testes. Okay, so those are equivalent terms. E not equivalent, but they are derived from the same tissues. They both make hormones, they both uh, produce the gametes. In the male, the tip of the penis is the glands of the penis, and that is essentially the same der derivative of the clitoris. So these are the um, erectile tissues of the reproductive systems. The scrotum, the skin that makes up the scrotum for the male, is essentially the same as the labia major. That's why I said in those kids born with the non, you know, not quite sure what ambiguous genitalia, is that a large scrotum, or is that a small scrotum, or a very large in, uh, labia? And again, there can be very confusing uh, to look at this. And then finally, one that we did not see in lab, but I want you to know about, the bulbo urethral glands in the male. They were the glands that made the pre-ejaculatory fluids for lubrication. Females also have glands called the vestibular glands that do the same thing. Now, vestibular, that seems like an odd word, but vestibular means entryway into, the opening. So in the opening of the vagina, on the sides, there are these little glands. They do not show up in the models. I'm not even sure if they show up in, I know they're not in Amerman. Uh, I will show you a picture in a few minutes of uh, a representation of these vestibular glands. But they, like the bobo urethra glands, are producing uh, mucousy secretions for lubrication. And that's what, you know, you can't turn on the TV without hearing about vaginal dryness, right? So those uh, glands are, are decreasing with age, leading to vaginal dryness with menopause. Okay, perineum. Perineum. Uh, this is, if you spread eagle, this is the diamond-shaped area basically between your thighs. And I'm going to show you that the kite or the diamond uh, of this. It is going to be bordered by the pubic symphysis. You can picture that. It's going to be bordered by the two t uh, uh, ischial tuberosities, right, the bone you're sitting on, and by the coccyx posteriorly. And this 
kite shaped or this diamond, this big diamond, can then be broken up into two smaller triangles. There's an anterior triangle and a posterior triangle. The anterior triangle is also called the urogenital triangle, and we'll see the borders of it, male and female. And the posterior triangle is the same in both sexes, and that is the anus to um, the ischial tuberosity. So let's take a look. This is uh, male on the right, female on the left. You can see this perineum. The perineum, again, is referring to this diamond-shaped region. And you can see the borders of it. So we have the pubic symphysis, the coccyx, and the two ischial tuberosities. The two triangles, the anterior triangle in the male is going up to the base of the scrotum. And in the female, it's going up to, basically, up to the pubic symphysis area as well. And then the, the posterior triangle is the same in both sexes, including the anus. Now, I always put this word right there. That's perineum, not to be confused with the peritoneum, right? So the perineum is that diamond-shaped region between the thighs. The peritoneum is something we've been talking about since day one. Right? One of the three serous membranes, the one that's wrapped around your abdominal pelvic organs. When you look at the female reproductive system, that's what we're talking about right now, and you look at where the uterus is protruding up into the abdominal pelvic cavity, you will appreciate that there are two pouches or dead-end recesses that are formed by the uterus kind of being stuck up in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Those two pouches... One is found between the uterus and the bladder, and one is found between the uterus and the rectum. And they're just called the vesico-uterine and the recto-uterine pouches. Um, also in the female system, the primary sex organs, as I've said, are the ovaries, and the accessory organs is everything else. Everything else is an accessory organ, most in the female being internal. And don't forget the uh, mammary glands are officially part of the female reproductive system. This is an image you saw in lab. It's basically the model with the uterus taken off. And what I was just talking about that was brand new for you were these pouches. So let's follow the peritoneum. My, my uh, marker, the red, is going around. And this is the peritoneum. It's that layer that's going to be, this is what, this would be the parietal peritoneum, right? It's lining the, the, the cavity. And it's going to come around, it's going to go around the top of the uterus and then come down here next to the rectum. And so what I've created now are two pouches, two pouches, and those are the two pouches I was just referring to. Okay. So, oops, come on. so that pouch in there between the bladder and the uterus, that's the vesico-uterine pouch, and then the more posterior pouch is the recto-uterine pouch. Nothing really fancy, just a new phenomenon from the uterus being protruded up into the abdominal pelvic cavity. Everything else on here should be pretty straightforward. Let me do the old dots. Let me do the lab exam dots, and you tell me what I've got, OK? Um, ovary, right? Fallopian tube or uterine tube, and I'll even accept oviduct. the very end, those little fingers, fimbrae. This is the uterus. And here, the cervix. Leading from the cervix, this tube is the vagina. Not to be confused, hopefully, with the urethra. I didn't tell my Monday groups. I told my group today. About four or five years ago, I had a student. She was the mother of four children. And when we got to this image in lab, I remember very clearly her raising her hand and saying, I don't have two openings. Or it was, I forget, it was news to her or verification of that she did not have both a vagina and a urethra. Now, I don't know if this was a woman who was way out of touch with her body, likely, or if there was some anatomical variation that I don't know anything about, 
where these two things merge. But I can't imagine that's the case, right, if she's had children. If she's got functional plumbing, I don't think that would have happened. Um, I'll just never forget, I, it, it, part of me was, like, really proud that she felt comfortable to ask or to say something like that in a laboratory setting. It must be a safe place. But there was also a part of me just kind of scratching my head saying, wow, you know, I wasn't going to do a physical exam, but it seemed odd, right? To, to, and she was just very, very confident that it wasn't even that she knew she was different. She was learning for the first time what there should have been there. Really? Maybe she thought odd. I suppose so, but I just don't, I mean, this is a grown woman with four children, so it's hard to imagine, but, you know, um, anyway, okay, a little sidebar, um, this is the bladder, right, not to be confused with the uterus, which does get screwed around on the practical a little bit, so make sure you got those two figured out, then this is the clitoris, and this would be the representing the pubic symphysis. Now, what do we have, clean this off, what do we have right in this area? What do we call, take that back, what do we call this entire band of muscle from here to here? That whole band of muscle would be the urogenital diaphragm, and it's what separates the outside world from the inside world, essentially. It's the pelvic floor, right, the muscles of the pelvic floor. And in that area, I heard the answer already, what would be right on either side here? That red would represent the external urethral sphincter, whereas the internal sphincter would be up here at the base of the bladder. I think that's it. Oh, and then uh, outside, larger fold, labia major, and more internally, labia minor. I think we've got the female down, okay? Any questions or concerns about the structures? So I showed this picture in, slide, in, in lab as well. Uh, to keep the uterus in its proper location in the abdominal pelvic cavity, it requires a ligament. The ligament is the broad ligament. It is gonna hold everything in its proper place. There's also an ovarian ligament that connects the ovary over to the uterus and if we slice into the ovary, we know what to expect, but I'm going to go through that with you again. Um, remember, the ovary has a hilum, right? Meaning a place where everything goes in or out. The ovary has a cortex, meaning there's an outer layer, and it has a medulla, a middle, or an inner layer. So let's talk about the process of oogenesis. Right, oogenesis is the making of eggs. And this is going to start out with cells way back in embryological fetal development. And those cells are going to begin meiosis. And those cells are going to be stopped very early in that process and then surrounded by a group of cells, I think of like bubble wrap. And those cells, those eggs, with the bubble wrap around them, are collectively called follicles. And within the cortex, these follicles are stored in the outer edge, the cortex of the ovary. Everywhere, right? In the picture, this is going to look like they're just in a little tiny area, but they're everywhere, all the way around the cortex of the ovary. So you've got the oocyte, the egg, inside these follicular cells that make it up. Those follicular cells are going to support and protect that egg 50 years, right? Up to 50 years. So that little egg is going to sit there just waiting for its day. All the way through puberty, all the way through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, even up to, men you know, to menopause at age 50 or so, that egg could be protected by those little bubble wrap cells. Pretty substantial. The process of oogenesis is going to be making the egg on a monthly basis. Now what happens is that before birth, this process begins. The cell that begins oogenesis is an oogonia, or are the oogonia. Each one is an oogonium. These cells are of limited number. There's probably six to seven million of these at the very beginning, way back in the early fetal development. Those oogonia are regular old cells 
they are diploid cells, and they are going to undergo meiosis, but as they begin meiosis, they get arrested, they get stopped, and that's where that egg sits, right, protected with that bubble wrap for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. At birth, a woman starts off between 6 and 7 million. By birth, the number has already dropped to 1.5 to 2 million. And the number will continue to drop throughout her lifetime. Okay. By puberty, the numbers have dropped even lower. So this dropping in number is called atresia. So atresia is the naturally occurring regression or breakdown of eggs. By the time a woman reaches puberty, she only has about 400,000 eggs left. That doesn't seem like a whole lot when you consider guys are making that many sperm in the next hour. Okay. At puberty, the hypothalamus is going to release a hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Let's break that down for a second. This is, this is the new stuff. I mean, a lot of this you've already heard in lab at least once. This is the new stuff, the hormones. So at puberty, the hypothalamus releases GNRH. Let's break that word down. Gonadotropin. I-N on the end, it's a protein, tropic, vocab, influencing, gonads, a protein that influences the gonads, gonadotropin, right? So don't make this harder than it needs to be. It's a new strange word. Break it down. So this is gonadotropin releasing hormone. So what's it going to do? This hormone is going to tell the body to release gonadotropins, molecules that influence the gonads. And basically, this is what wakes up and starts puberty. The anterior pituitary, in response to this, will start releasing FSH and LH. FSH is follicle-stimulating hormone. It tells us what it's going to do. It's going to stimulate the making of these follicles to develop the eggs further. And luteinizing hormone and on Monday or Wednesday in lab, you may have heard me say the corpus luteum. So the luteinizing hormone must have something to do with, again, that ovarian cycle. We'll get to that. The levels of FSH and the levels of LH are cyclic. And this is what sets up the ovarian cycle. This is what sets up the uterine cycle. This is why women go through their monthly cycles, okay, because of these hormones. Ladies need to understand this because it's their body. Men need to understand this just because. Just to get out of the way, right? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the ovarian cycle first. There's three parts. Follicular phase, ovulation, and luteal phase. So let's take a look at this. The first phase of the ovarian cycle. So this is what the ovary is doing every month starting with puberty. First part is follicular phase. It sounds like we're going to be doing what? Making a follicle. So we're going to take that little bubble-wrapped follicle, and about 20 or so of these will begin to develop. We don't understand why, but about 20 every month will start the journey. That's going to be about four, 13 days. This is the 28-day cycle that we're describing. So the first 13 days, and during those 13 days, although 20 start, only one makes it to the end. Then on day 14, that one that makes it to the end will be released or ovulated from the ovary. That egg is now hopefully going to be sucked up by the fimbrae and drawn into the fallopian tube where perhaps sperm are waiting for fertilization. Finally, there's luteal phase. This is going to be 15 to the end, 15 to 28. And if you'll remember, and I'll show this to you again, that after ovulation, the cells that were partially wrapped around the egg were going to go on to form that big yellow body called the corpus luteum. So during this luteal phase, that corpus luteum is being formed. And that corpus luteum is going to be really, really important and is going to tell the uterus not to shed the lining. So that corpus luteum is going to hang around for about 10 to 13 days. After which, if there's fertilization, then the embryo itself will start releasing hormones. But if there's no fertilization, then the uterus will begin to slough off 
and the corpus luteum will become the corpus albicans. And this is what sets up menstruation again. Now, if the egg was fertilized and the embryo has been formed, the embryo itself will start releasing HCG, human chorionic. It's, it's from the layer of the early uh, embryo called the chorion, conatotropin hormone. So what is it doing again? It's in influencing the gonads. And HCG is going to tell the uterus not to shed the lining. Now, where have you heard of HCG? HCG is the molecule that you run to Walgreens and get the little, you know, EPT, the early pregnancy test. What you're measuring is HCG. Those are extremely sensitive tests. It's the embryo itself that's making that HCG. And that level of HCG continues to increase. And that HCG tells the uterus, hey, I'm here. Do not menstruate. Do not slough off the layer. Now, I'll tell you a little story to help you remember this HCG. So our second child, our second pregnancy, I should say, um, one of our best friends uh, was an OBGYN. And he said, oh, let's, let's go take a peek. So we were about mm, seven or eight weeks, right, really early. Um, we had told our parents, but that was about it. And it was a Friday afternoon. And we went to the doctor. Let's take a little quick sonogram. Let's take a little look at the little guy. No heartbeat. Okay, so the embryo had already died. So to confirm it, it was a Friday afternoon, and we measured my wife's HCG levels, okay, so as a precaution, just see what the levels were. Came back on Monday and looked at the levels again. If the embryo is still alive and is still developing, those HCG levels could, should continue to rise and even double in number. The numbers were going down. So the sonogram showed again, no heartbeat, the HCG levels were coming down. Now, what would have happened if we had not gone to see the doctor, and if he wasn't our friend, and we hadn't taken a sneak peek, what would happen in the, probably in the next week or so? She would have miscarried spontaneously. What told her uterus to let it go? Those dropping HCG levels. So the HCG levels are what are telling the uterus to maintain the layer. And if the embryo passes, then those layers will drop, and eventually they'll come to a point, just like at the end of the cycle, and the uterus will shed. Yeah, sometimes the body will not naturally do it. Now, I don't know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak maybe a little out of turn. I think it will eventually do it. You're saying spontaneously abort. But not many women are willing to sit around and wait. Okay, so in an early OB appointment, if it is discovered that the embryo has passed and it's a non-viable pregnancy, most women will choose to go in and have a DNC, okay, to have the embryo removed. Um, some would prefer not to go through that procedure and will wait spontaneously for their body to do that for them. But not many women anymore are willing to wait a week or two for a spontaneous abortion. That just is not a comfortable thing. So I, I don't know that the body would never, right? It just hasn't happened yet. And so typically the doctors will go in and facilitate that. Question in the back. Right. Baby. Just, uh, no baby at all. Okay. Right. Well, the other thing too is that okay, if, if that embryo is dying or dead, then there's a greater chance of infection. Right. There's a greater chance of things going wrong. So it's better to just take it, get it over with surgically, and be safer about it, and then let the body heal and rebound if you want another child. So that's typically, I've, I've never heard of that one, Wendy, of the was, empty. I think she got it, she got pregnant soon after her I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. No right, interesting, yeah. Exactly. The empty baby syndrome, or the empty, empty, yeah. yeah. Interesting, I, I don't know that one. Next time you do a short paper for me, do it on that. I want to learn about that, okay? Okay, um, so HCG, a little, little side story about HCG. Um, so let's talk about the ovarian cycle then. We're looking at a cartoon. We're looking at the ovary. Again, the outer, uh, the outer layer would be considered the cortex. And so what we find in the cortex are those primordial follicles. Again, they would be everywhere. This is a simplified cartoon. What's happening during the follicular phase, the first 13 days? That's when 
20 of these or so are developed. And of those 20, they're going to go through this series of steps, but 19 of them are going to drop off. Now, that number 20 is not an exact number, but it's just an approximation. Of those 20, only one will make it, and the one that makes it will make it to be much, much larger. And that is called the graphene. There's three words for this baby, unfortunately. You may see graphene, G-R-A-A-F-I-A-N. You might see it called the tertiary. You might see it called the mature. Or, I said three words, four words, or vesicular. Okay, they're all the same thing, unfortunately. So mature follicle, I think, is a whole lot easier. Tertiary follicle is not too hard. Um, graphene was the person who described it and vesicular follicle. But that's the one that's going to be released, right, on ovulation. So when does ovulation happen? On day 14. So days 1 through 13, we're forming the follicle. Day 14, we're going to release. And then what was day 15 to the end? What was that called? Luteal phase. So what's happening here is now what was left behind, what was left behind here is going to become the corpus luteum. And I told you the corpus luteum is releasing hormones. And those hormones are doing what? What are they telling the uterus? I just released an egg. If that egg is fertilized, there's an embryo on its way. And when will that embryo reach the uterus? About six more days. So it's about a six-day journey down your mother's fallopian tube. So that Corpus luteum will keep making those hormones, and as those hormones tell the uterus, hang in there, there might be an embryo on the way. If there is an embryo, I told you the embryo starts making HCG, takes care of itself. But if there is no embryo, the corpus luteum is short-lived, only lets the uterus stay together for about 10 or 13 more days, and then becomes, regresses, to become the corpus albicans. No more hormones are being produced, and as a result, the menstrual lining sheds. So we go around the cycle again. So this is in picture what I just showed you. So that's going on in the ovary. Let's also make sure we understand this whole thing of oogenesis. And then we'll finish up with the uterine cycle. So oogenesis, you saw this one in lab. This is the oogonium. This cell is diploid. It has 46 chromosomes. And it actually starts making the egg long before birth. But that process, again, gets stuck early in the, in the process and is protected as a primordial follicle. That primordial follicle is wrapped in the bubble wrap and sits in the cortex of the ovary all the way through childhood until puberty hits. At that point, from you know, age 12 on or whatever, 20 of those primordial follicles will begin the journey of which one will win, and that one is becoming the vesicular follicle that vesicular follicle is the one that will be released on day 14. And then if it's fertilized, right, then it can become the embryo. Um, so that's just a quick reminder about oogenesis. So what happens with menopause? At menopause, actually as a, as a woman approaches menopause, we might call that perimenopause, right, near, around menopause. And at this point, estrogen levels start to drop. Estrogen levels drop. A woman may start experiencing irregular periods or lighter periods. By definition, when a woman has stopped having monthly menstrual cycles for an entire year and is not pregnant, then she has reached menopause. And that's usually going to set in and, and start occurring somewhere between the 45 to 55 year cycle, okay, somewhere in there. So at this point, the follicles, there are no more, right? The follicles are pretty much gone. There are no more eggs being produced. The estrogen is low down. As a result, there's no more endometrial lining being sloughed off. There's no more menstrual flow. And she has officially reached menopause. Coming off from the uterus, and we're kind of following from the ovary down the fallopian tube or down the uterine tube, um, this is where fertilization occurs, right, inside the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. And some books will call this the pre-embryo. I don't agree with those terms. It is an embryo. But some people will refer to the pre-embryo as before it implants, and then the embryo only after it implants. Again, five or six-day journey for that embryo to reach the uterus. 
And the uterus has multiple functions. Of course, it's the site for implantation. So it's where the uterus is, it's where the embryo is going to hang out for about nine months. And during that time, the uterus is going to uh, get larger, more muscular, be more prepared for the contractions of birth. Uh, there's going to be a connection made uh, with the baby and the mother's vascular supply, and we call that the placenta. The uterus, once contractions begin, the body will start making oxytocin. Oxytocin is naturally going to cause the uterus to contract for birth. In the lab, or sorry, in the lab, in the, in the hospital, if a woman is in labor and they want to speed it along, they might give her pitocin. It's an oxytocin-like molecule. And then, obviously, the uterus is also the site of menstruation. The walls of the uterus, pretty straightforward, peri, myo, and endometrium. We learned back in the M's that M-E-T-R meant womb. So these are the layers of the womb. Peri around, that's the outside. Myo, the muscle layer, the thick layer of the, of the uterus. And then the endometrium is the inner layer, like the endocardium or the endothelium. The endometrium. And this is the layer that's sloughing off on a monthly basis. The outer layer of the uterus is the serous membrane. The muscle layer is the myometrium. We get that and it does become much, much thicker. This is smooth muscle, right? There's no, you don't have any voluntary control over this, and, and uh, the contractions, you don't really have control over that. What a woman has control over during, during childbirth is the pushing is sort of, uh, there's some control, but not anywhere near as much as it would suggest. Now, we're down to the uterus now, and the uterus is also going through cycles. These cycles are also run by the same hormones, that are running the ovarian show. In the uterus, we've got a 28-day cycle, and the first five days here are the menstrual phase. This is the bleeding phase. This is when the endometrium is sloughing off. Then, once the inside layer sloughs off, it's gonna rebuild itself, and this is the proliferative phase. This is gonna be defined as day six through 14. Um, proliferative. Um, if the North Koreans are proliferating their arms, right? then they're building them up. So that's the proliferative phase. We're building up the inside layer. And then finally there is the secretory phase, and this is gonna be day 15 to 28. Now 15 to 28 is the same as what phase in the ovary? I want you to compare these things. 15 to 28, days 15 to 28, is the same as the luteal phase back in the ovary. And what was happening in the luteal phase? you were forming the corpus luteum. And what was the corpus luteum doing? Secreting hormones. So that's the term. That's where this connection is. So those days of the luteal phase in the ovary are the same as the secretory phase in the uterus because you're releasing those hormones from the corpus luteum. Again, if there is no embryo, then the corpus luteum will drop its levels of hormones and menstrual cycle will begin once again. I'm gonna show you this slide. This one's new. Then the next one is the one you've already seen. And what I kinda of want you to do as I talk about these two slides is almost superimpose them, and I'll help you with that in a moment. Here are the hormones that are regulating female cycles. On the top, these are the hormones that are going to affect the ovary. So this is the ovary. And the hormones that are going to affect the, horm uh, affect the ovary are called the gonadotropins, right? The hormones that affect or influence the gonads. And these two hormones are FSH and LH. What do you see? They both spike right before ovulation. That's all I want you to see. That in this cyclic pattern, both LH and FSH spike about a day or so right before ovulation. Okay? So they're going to they're gonna tell the ovary to spit out the, the egg. Then what's happening down in the, this is what's happening in the uterus. In the uterus, the ovaries are making estrogen and progesterone. And what I want you to see is that in the pre- ovulation times. This is estrogen. Estrogen 
is the main hormone of proliferative phase. Okay, that's estrogen. And then once ovulation occurs, look what happens. Progesterone then becomes the primary hormone. What is releasing that progesterone? What's releasing that progesterone? What was forming after ovulation? Corpus luteum, okay? So the corpus luteum is largely responsible for this increase in progesterone as well as this increase in estrogen. Okay, so what I, what I need you to be able to do is, and I'm going to do this for you right now, the top again is the ovary, the bottom again is the uterus. What happens right here? Oops. Kind of draw this in. What happens right here? That was the spike in both LH and FSH. Then, what was happening here? There was a big rise in estrogen. So what is estrogen doing? Building up the endometrium. And then, what was there over here? Let me change it to colors. Then here, there was this big rise in progesterone. And look at that curve of progesterone. It's much like the curve of the building of the endometrium. So the estrogen is primarily building and the progesterone is primarily maintaining. Okay, Because you also saw estrogen here as well, but it wasn't as much of a pump. Okay, So that's kind of, I just want you to kind of superimpose those hormones onto this and make sense of this. On this figure, it does label the cycles of the uterine cycle. There's the first five days menstrual, up through 14 proliferative, and then the rest is secretory. This does not label the top. Um, so what were the first 13 days here? That was a follicular phase, wasn't it? The first 13 days. And then there was ovulation on day 14. And then this was luteal phase, right, through the end. I won't ask you to draw this out, of course, but I do want you to have a sense of this. We're not going to go any more complicated than this. This is plenty. OBGYNs, right, spend a lot of years learning this well and dealing with these hormone levels. Primary docs do, too. So here are those days. Here are the days of the cycles. So one through five, and, and, and this shows both the ovarian and the uterine cycle side by side with the names. So kind of get a sense of the timing of this, one in the ovary, one in the uterus. And then I gave you five different hormones. I mentioned GnRH. That was released by the hypothalamus. That started the whole thing. And then there was FSH and LH made by the anterior pituitary that go to the ovary. And then there was estrogen and progesterone made by the ovary that go to the uterus. So look at this set of sort of a hierarchy of hormones. Where is it coming from and who is it talking to? Right? Who's starting it and who's it talking to? And what's going on as a result of this hormone? After we get through those cycles, very quickly, the vagina. This is a thick uh, fibromuscular tube, about 10 centimeters or so in length from external to the cervix. And it would more commonly be called perhaps the birth canal. This is the compilatory organ and, of course, the passageway for menstruation. The vaginal wall is heavily filled with blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, and that certainly makes sense. Uh, lymphatic vessels to help protect against invading organisms. The vagina is relatively thin, and there are three layers here, uh, mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. Uh, certainly not serous, right? We're not anywhere up in the abdominal pelvic cavity, so the adventitia referring to the outer outside of the peritoneum, and the middle layer, the muscularis. Externally, there's not much externally in the female. Collectively, all that one can see uh, externally is called the vulva. The vulva. That's going to include the mons pubis. That is the uh, fatty area right in front of the pubic symphysis, where most of the pubic hair is. And you also have the labia majora or the ma labia major. 
that is homologous with the scrotum and the labia minor. The clitoris is homologous with the penis. The tip of the clitoris is homologous with the glands, the tip of the penis. And the, the, uh, the foreskin of the penis is similar to or homologous with the little hood that covers over the clitoris as well. And that's the prepus. Now, this is the only picture I have of vestibular glands. So mons pubis, and we've got the labia major and the labia minor. This is the opening for the vagina and the opening for the urethra. And again, the opening into the vagina is the vestibule. And just off from this area are these little vestibular glands. So they're going to be releasing um, lubricating fluids. And not as common anymore, uh, episiotomies during childbirth, sometimes the baby's head uh, a little larger than the vaginal opening, and so um, they would have to do a, a cutting uh, of the vaginal wall and episiotomy and then sew it up later on. Um, they still do these, but typically now if the baby's a little too large, they'll go for a C-section and try to avoid this if possible. Oop, and then finally, I think the next slide is breast. Just as a reminder that the breast is important uh, as part of the overall female reproductive system. And we talked about the lymphatic vessels that are around the breast a few weeks ago in lab. Uh, remember, there's quite a few axillary lymph nodes that are found uh, in this area, which are commonly tested uh, if there's breast cancer. And uh, here, under hormonal control, the ducts here will start producing milk uh, and uh, provide nourishment for the young. So that brings us to the end of female. Okay, that's all the female stuff. The male's not as complicated, uh, and we'll get that going here. I'll give you a couple minutes of break, and we'll come back and we'll do male. Okay, any thoughts, questions on female? The big thing, honestly, here isn't the anatomy. It's really those last few slides on cycles. So that's the thing that, you know, is probably the most new or the most uh, uh, confusing. So take a qu close look at the hormones and the cycles and the number of days in the cycles, and you'll be fine. The last little bit is going to be uh, the male reproductive system, and this will be primarily, again, compare and contrast, and you know most of this. So we've got the primary gonads or the testes. Everything else are just the fancy plumbing and duct work that's going to carry uh, this, the sperm out of the body. Uh, the, the penis is the organ of copulation, and you've seen, actually no, we didn't do this view in lab. This view looks a lot like your model that you have, the flat, the flat boy model. Um, so let's just, let's just kind of do the old uh, uh, yellow sticker thing again. So what do I have here? Testis one or testes two, I'm not gonna take off for that, but no testes, right? No, no testes or whatever. T-E-S, T-I-E-S, none of that. So it's either one testis or two testes. And then sitting on the superior border of the testis is the epididymis. And then this is the vas deferens or ductus deferens. And that's the tube that's going to carry the sperm upon ejaculation. That's going to come up, as we know, and come up right next to, it's not a good color, come up right next to the bladder and merge with this gland. That gland is the seminal vesicle that's making the majority of the semen. And now what's going to happen is that the sperm are going to come up and meet with the fluid from the seminal vesicle and go into this. And that is the ejaculatory duct. Right? The ejaculatory duct is then going to drain that sperm and seminal fluids into the urethra. Okay. Now, this big old gland here is the prostate, and this pushpin looking thing, bulbo urethral or cowper gland. And the cowper gland is releasing those pre ejaculatory fluids which are then going to travel down this little duct that you see here and then drain it into 
the urethra. Uh, what is this large blood filling region? Green? Cavernosa. And on either side of the urethra, corpus spongiosum, uh, which is why that's called the spongy urethra. The tip, the glands of the penis, and then the prepus is the foreskin. That's about it. Okay, coming down. We see the urethra coming down. Or, yeah, or, yeah, sorry. Ooh. Ureter coming down and heading to the bladder, isn't it? Now, one more question. What is coming down from the body? We don't see it here very well. We'll see it in another view coming up. Let me see if it's this view. I'm going to come back to that question in a second. Um, sperm production is happening in the scrotum, in the testis, at a temperature that is lower than body temperature. Some boys are born with an empty scrotum, and the testis is still up in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, typically, that testis will descend down into the scrotum before birth. But in a preemie, it's not going to be there, and in some boys, it's just not there. It will usually descend naturally within a year. But if it does not descend, then it will have to be surgically brought down because sperm production cannot occur at body temperature. So that guy will be sterile if that scrotum, or that, if that um, testis stays up inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. So it must come down. Around the testis, um, there is a muscle, the cremaster muscle, and the cremaster muscle is going to relax and allow the, the scrotum to be pulled closer and further away from the body. So in a cold day, scrotum is pulled up to the body to help maintain the heat. On a warm day, it's released. Not only is the scrotum released or pulled up, but also the, the skin, the scrotal sac, actually becomes thicker or thinner uh, relating to the temperature changes. So you got to have the right temperature for optimal sperm production. This is what I wanted to go to. So the testis would be, normally, before birth, would be sitting up here, in the abdominal pelvic cavity, sort of in the same place that the ovaries are in the female. And then they're going to descend down. And as they descend down, they're going to come down through this ligament. And this is the inguinal ligament. So there's an opening there, right? And the inguinal ligament, the testis is going to come down. But once it comes down, notice there's quite a bit of stuff going in and out through that inguinal ligament. This is the reason that guys have to go through hernia examinations. So, you know, turn and cough kind of thing. And what the doctor is feeling for is that inguinal ligament has the opening become compromised. And is it too large? Because what will happen is that abdominal structures can actually come down. Intestines have been known to come down through that inguinal ligament and come into the scrotum if that thing becomes enlarged or weakened. So that would be an inguinal or a, high, uh, a hernia of some sort. Um, so we see that coming down into the scrotum, we have, of course, the testis and the epididymis. And what else is coming down? What's traveling through this area referred to as the spermatic cord? And here they're listed for us. There's a testicular artery that's bringing blood down to the testis that's oxygenated. There's a testicular nerve bringing sensory signals up and down to the testis. The ductus deferens, the vas deferens, is passing through here. And the last thing is the papiniform plexus. Okay, and the papiniform plexus is a group of veins. We learned that plexus means a group of nerves, but it can be a group of anything. So the papiniform plexus is coming down, and you see that the testicular artery is passing through that weaving of veins. I just told you that the temperature of sperm production must be cooler and that blood coming down from the body is warm. And that, that would be bringing too much warmth to the testis. And so the passage of that artery past those veins is actually cooling down the temperature of the blood so that it's not going to interfere with sperm production. So pretty, pretty fancy system to have that group of veins cooling down the blood as it comes down to the testis. Can you speak about that? Papiniform? 
pinniform plexus. Um, of pinniform plexus. Oh, okay. It's this group of veins. You see the group of veins? Okay, so is. yes, it's that group of veins, it's that series, that cluster, that plexus of veins that are cooling off the blood as it's passing by, the blood coming down, okay? So those veins are going out, right? The papiniform plexus is carrying blood out, the testicular arteries bringing blood in, and they pass by each other and cool each other off. Now, in the, uh, the cremaster muscle is the muscle here that's going to be pulling the scrotum up, and there's also the dartus muscle that is around the scrotal sac. So when it's cold, the scrotum kind of shrivels up and shrinkles. That's the dartus muscle shriveling, shriveling it up and causing it to get thicker. And it also relaxes and thins out in warm weather. And the cremaster is the one that pulls up and pulls the scrotum closer or further away from the body. Um, just a lovely dissection, right, of the male structures. Good day to be alive. Um, so here the... the um, Scrotum's been opened up, and you can see the testis, and you can see the epididymis here on the top of it. Um, nothing really else to show there. I just wanted to show that image to you for shock effect. Um, now, the next slide, is it in your notes? Okay, I meant to take it out. Uh, Diphalia, it, it, it is a real thing. I mean, it's a circus act. Um, I don't know if they're both functioning, right? But there has been examples of uh, diphalia, two penises. Uh, okay, testes. Uh, so you're in the testis, and in the testis, what are you going to see? Cut into it, you're going to see tube, 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 tube. And those tubes are all called seminiferous tubules. And those tubules are surrounded by spaces called interstitial spaces. In those interstitial spaces are cells called interstitial cells, or by the guy who described them, lytic cells. I'll show those to you in a moment. It's the lytic cells that are producing the testosterone. Those uh, lytic cells are very, very close to the seminiferous tubule, so upon uh, puberty. Uh, the testosterone is going to wake up those cells and start making sperm. This, is, this testosterone is also responsible for the secondary characteristics uh, that come on with male puberty. So here is a cartoon of the scrotum, and there's a couple things here, or actually of the testis, what I want you to see right here, right? That's the spermatic cord, and again, what's, what's going through there? Four things going up and down through the scrotum, up through the inguinal ligament, testicular artery, papiniform plexus of veins, testicular vein, uh, nerve, and the ductus deferens. All right, those are the four things passing collectively through what's called the spermatic cord. So in the lumen, in the center of the testis, tube, 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 and it's in there that the sperm are being produced. The sperm are then going to be washed. They can't swim yet. They're useless swimmers. They're just going to be kind of floating toward the epididymis. So they go up and they get stored again in another series of tubing called the epididymis. And again, there they're going to learn how to swim. They're going to go through some maturation. They're going to be stored there for a while and then either apoptose, broken down, or released upon ejaculation. Um, there are some layers around this that I told you to cross off in lab. Same thing is true. So don't worry about the tunica albiginia and the tunica vaginalis. We won't worry about those layers here nor in lab. The spermatic cord, what I just tell us, right? It's going to be carrying four things again. I keep saying it, it must be important. Uh, blood vessels and nerves and the ductus deferens, those things that are passing up and down through. You saw this picture in lab as well. What I want to tell you about is a little bit about the detail of the formation of sperm. We're looking inside, we're looking at a cross section of a very, of a, of a seminiferous tubule and around the outside of this tubule, there are cells, and these cells are spermatogonia. And those spermatogonia are the same as the oogonia back in the egg, and these are the cells that are going to start making sperm. They're not going to start making it, however, until puberty. These cells outside, these are the interstitial cells, also called the lytic cells. 
Those are the cells making the testosterone. So at puberty, testosterone is being produced. The testosterone only has to travel a very, very short distance and turn these cells on. These cells will then be turned on for the rest of the male's uh, uh, lifetime, making sperm. And through this, we're going to be going through meiosis, and we're going to be making four equal size but genetically different cells. Those cells are all haploid, and as we saw, the sperm are going to empty tail first into the lumen. So this is going to give the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, it looks like a lot of long cilia, but those are the tails, the flagella of the sperm. This entire process, again, is spermatogenesis, and this little tiny subset where you go from a round spherical cell to a sperm, this little subset is called spermiogenesis. Spermiogenesis, if I put it back on this slide, spermiogenesis is from here. Oops. Spermiogenesis is simply from here to here. Just this little bit is spermiogenesis. And during that spermiogenic process, as I said before in, lect in lab, the, the nucleus, remember that's a 23, that's a haploid nucleus, and that nucleus is going to get shoved up into the head. On the outside of the nucleus is that little Golgi apparatus bag, and that bag is going to become the acrosome and sit at the very extreme end of the sperm. The mitochondria are going to get sequestered to the midpiece, and microtubules are going to grow and extend to form the flagellum. Most sperm are pretty good at swimming, about up to 5%, and in some males more, the sperm are pretty useless. They swim in circles. They, they just don't have any directionality to them. Uh, sperm are heat-seeking missiles. They are drawn both by temperature and by chemicals. So they, they are not just wandering aimlessly. They are truly being drawn by temperature. It's warmer toward the vaginals in the body, and they're being drawn toward chemicals that are drawing them toward their target. Before they're released, again, they're, they're stored in the epididymis. And like I said, this is where they're going to kind of grow up. Within the epididymis, that little tiny bit, there's another four or five meters of tubing. I mean, this is pretty amazing stuff, right? Meters and meters and meters of tubing within the testes. And here again, the sperm are going to become mature. And also, just as a side note, if a male ex is ejaculating too soon, um, not during intercourse, but ejaculating too often, I should say, and those sperm have not yet had a chance to mature, then those sperm will be pretty useless once they reach the vagina. So it's more important about timing than frequency for getting pregnant. So if you're trying to get pregnant, it's not about every five hours. It's about proper timing and making sure that the little boys have had time to grow up to swim. Okay? Because if you're shooting too often, it's not going to happen. Um, and again, um, the question came up in lab on Monday, I think. Um, the sperm that are being produced will be just simply broken down, apoptosis, they, they call it reabsorbed, but they're going to be broken down. So the sperm that are going to be released are going to be fresh or at least viable sperm. They may not be good swimmers, but they're not going to be the dead and de decaying ones. Those will be separated out and not released. The sperm that are being released are going through the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. We saw it. It comes up out of the spermatic cord goes up along the bladder, and then meets with the uh, seminal glands and um, merges into the ejaculatory duct. At this point, the sperm are now in the urethra. And you know that the urethra in the male has two purposes. One, the passage of urine from the bladder. And there's three parts of the urethra. We saw this in the urinary system as well. The prostatic urethra, the part that passes through the prostate, a little tiny region called the membranous urethra, and then the majority of it referred to as the penile or spongy urethra. So the vagina is a very acidic environment, and that acidity is important for vaginal health. It re reduces bacterial uh, growth in the vagina. And... Uh, Sperm, however, cannot survive in that acidic environment. So the seminal fluids must neutralize that acidity. And so the, the pH levels must be brought up closer to neutral. And also, the sperm 
if, it, if you think about an egg, an egg is large. It has cytoplasm. And just like a chicken egg, there are some nutrients inside an egg. Right? Think about the egg. It has to float for five or six days. It has to nourish the embryo and have enough energy in it for two, four, eight, 16, 132 cells. Right? That has to keep happening. There has to be nutrients in the egg. The sperm does not carry any nutrients in it. All the nutrients are in the embryo, in the zygote, until the placenta is established, and then the nutrients are coming from the mother. So the sperm has no nutrients. It has a very, very small cytoplasm. So it has to rely upon fructose and other molecules in the seminal fluids to provide energy. And these fluids, you've seen them, are the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbourethral gland. So you saw these slides in lab. The seminal vesicles, these are producing the majority of the, of the solution. And there were three or four things here that are important. Number one, the fluid is viscous. It is alkaline. It contains fructose. And it has prostaglandins. Each of those is important. Viscosity, uh, the semen has to be sticky. It has to stick to the vaginal wall. Number two, alkaline to reduce the acidity. Fructose for energy and prostaglandins to help it open up the smooth muscles so the sperm can go toward the uterus. The prostate gland also is releasing energy molecules, a molecule called seminoplasmin, uh, and also PSA. And in lab, I told you, PSA is commonly screened in men as a sign of a healthy prostate. So PSA levels go up if the prostate is enlarging or if perhaps it's cancerous. And then finally, there's the bulbourethral glands named after the dude Calper. And these are, ejacula or these are releasing the pre-ejaculatory fluids um, for lubrication. But also recall that these, these uh, pre-ejaculatory fluids are also cleansing out the urethra, getting rid of the urine that is also acidic so that the sperm are not sitting in an acidic solution. This is the slide I started the lab with. So on this, I don't think you're going to have any trouble recognizing the structures. I'll just do the little yellow dots again. Um, down here in the testis, what do we have? All the tubes are the seminiferous tubules. The sperm are going to go there to the epididymis, be released through the vas deferens, pass by the ureter and the bladder while traveling right next to the seminal vesicles. The sperm and the semen will then mix and travel through this little duct that we see. It's kind of hard. This duct right here is the ejaculatory duct into the urethra. This big dude is the prostate. These are bulbourethral urethral glands. Got it. Yeah. It does. It does. So that's another distinction, right? Uh, eggs are released from one ovary or the other. But upon ejaculation, both uh, testes are contributing. Both seminal vesicles are contributing. The prostate's contributing. Um, I don't know of any sided issue in ejaculation. Uh, last couple slides here, guys. So semen uh, is a combination of the seminal fluids from these glands and the sperm contained therein. The average ejaculate is three to five milliliters. So what is that? Five milliliters is a teaspoon, right? So we're looking about a half, a half to a full teaspoon. That's normal. And within that ejaculate, 200 to 500 million sperm. Under 100 million is considered infertile. That's amazing, right? So a guy who is, quote, infertile or is have, there's a low sperm count, under 100 million is considered low. You would think 100 million would be plenty, right, to get the job done. But under 100, it is not. The, the chances of successful is, is dropped almost to the point of zero. Um, again, about two weeks from the time the sperm are produced, way up at the spermatogonia, way up there, all the way through until ejaculation, about two weeks. So it's a two-week cycle, and that's why if a guy is going in for an X-ray and they you know, cover up the gonads, um, I always just joke, don't have kids for two weeks, right? Because you're going to have a complete new set of sperm within two weeks. 
and there's no issues that x-ray could not have harmed or mutated any of the sperm, whereas in the female, that's not the possibility, right? The eggs are there, they're not going anywhere, you can't make more, the eggs are prone to that damage, and that's why women who are older are more prone to have children with genetic problems because the eggs do get older. The sperm aren't getting older, they're fresh and clean all the time, but the, the eggs are getting old, and that leads to higher incidences of Down syndrome and to higher incidences of other genetic problems. Um, I, I said this already, semen um, in a very sexually active male, there may actually be a reduced sperm count. The glands can usually keep up with rapid ejaculation, so the volume may be similar, but the sperm count will be dropped in that. And I think that's your last slide, and I'm going to jump ahead. I used to talk about these things, and I haven't had time lately. As you can see, I've got one minute. I've been talking for a whole semester, and I'm one minute from the end. I've got this thing down pretty well. Okay. Now, where do you pick up again? Okay. This one? One before? Yeah, okay. So vasectomy, what is it? Cutting the vas, right? And uh, snip, snip, right? So... There's also equivalent, although much more complicated, in the female tubal ligation. In both of these procedures, you're cutting the tube. You're cutting or blocking the tube of the fallopian tube. That means the egg can't get out um, or the sperm can't get up. And you're, you're cutting the vas deferens so that the sperm cannot be released. Um, not perfect, but pretty good success with these. Basically, for the guy, go to the scrotum, little incision, Go in, pull up the vas deferens, cut it or cauterize it, drop it back in, stitch up the scrotum, done on Friday, back to work on Monday. Um, for women, much more complicated. Typically, tubules are going to be done at childbirth. So during that whole process, is more likely, this is more of a surgical procedure uh, to get the, quote, tubes tied. After this, there's always a slight possibility that those tubes find each other again right, and that sperm can be uh, passing through, and there is some success, but limited in reversing these. So typically a guy or a gal going through this surgery is being counseled by the doctor, are you sure, right, that this is really uh, the end of your reproductive desires, because the likelihood of this being reversed is pretty low. And then finally, what happens, is this where we go next? What happens as we get older, oh joy, right, for women, menopause. Um, an atrophy of the organs, vaginal decrease, vaginal wall um, gets thinner and secretions decrease leading to um, vaginal dryness. The uterus will shrink and atrophy and become even smaller than it was before puberty. That's going to be with menopause. And really for the guys, there isn't much change, right? There's not really a big decrease in function um, that occurs. Gametes stop being produced in the female between 40 and 50. That's menopause. With guys, they just keep on going strong. I'm one minute over. I apologize. Okay. So, what's on the final? Respiratory. Review that on your own again. Uh, urinary and reproductive. Next, Wednesday or Thursday in the testing center. Last little bit of vocab. There's a little bit of cumulative on there. Uh, and those cumulative questions are short answer, uh, connections. So just connecting one system to another system. And are there any questions? What's that? That's a quarter of the test. Not a quarter. Um, I, there was actually, I think, 30 of those. 30. 30. And then I threw a few multiple choice questions in extra. It's stuff you should, exactly. It's not stuff that you have to go study, but it is something that's going to cause you to pull together the ideas. So things like, how is the lymphatic system connected to the cardiovascular system? What would you tell me, Wendy? Um, I would, like, would the lymphatic system detect the blood? They could. Fluid, fluid, fluid. Fluid levels, edema, swelling. Right, so there's a connection there. Or what if I said uh, lymphatic and urinary? That was even easier. Fluid, 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 right? So if you're urinating well, then you're getting fluid off your body. If you weren't urinating, that fluid would build up and you'd be complaining of edema. 
So just a, just a connection like that, just a, a statement that makes makes me know that you're making connections, that you're making uh, a bigger, you're, you're understanding the connections between the systems. Um, really not something you can study for, I agree. It's more just pull it out of the hat, and you should, I think it's pretty straightforward. There might be a couple that stump you, so I might even consider as a, as a strategy, go there first, go there first, dump down the ones you can do quickly, and then be thinking about it during the rest of the test and then finish it up. That'd be a good strategy, I think, as you approach that test. If you haven't already made your appointment, do that. And don't forget it also, too, about the Madison post-test.